We have 100 new people now that we have the opportunity to stay connected with, help them grow and prepare to be in the leadership positions that are available to them that we never would have known before. And the other benefit of having done that is that this past year resulted in, because of those very targeted recruiting tactics, this past year wound up being our most diverse slate, in my experience and in the slates that I've seen before. So we have men, we have non-white individuals, we have individuals from across the country, and it's been really fascinating to see those efforts built over several years in small ways pay off in this way. This is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Rhea Steele, Chief of Staff and Vice President of Strategy and Governance at the School Nutrition Association, or SNA. Hey, Rhea, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Rhea, tell us about SNA. So SNA, we are a national nonprofit professional organization that works with individuals who provide high-quality, low-cost meals to students across the country. So basically anybody who provides school meals whether it's breakfast, lunch, after school, in the K-12 environment. So we've got around about 50,000 members across the U.S., and it's everyone from individuals who are working in the cafeteria to those actually setting the meal plans in schools to the individuals who are working at the state level actually implementing regulations for school meals. Man, Rhea, during the pandemic, it felt like school meal programs were at the center of the universe or part of the center of the universe. And I know that my son, who was going to high school here in Alexandria, going to public school, I felt like every other email was about school meals, how to pick up food. If there was virtual learning, this is where you could pick up food during the break. And then after, you know, when, when, the, when the kids came back to in person, they made school lunch and school breakfast completely free. So that, it sounds like school meals are just so incredibly important, and that's the work that your members do. Oh, absolutely. And I can't even tell you how powerful it was to be watching and supporting our members as they literally went from finding out that they were shut down to trying to figure out how to get food into the hands of kids so that they would actually have meals. I mean, the number of stories that I've heard from our members about knowing that some of these kids that they serve, you know, if they're not at school, if they're not coming into the lunchroom, they actually don't have good meals that they can get access to. And so it's so critical for the well-being of the kids that our members were able to provide those services during the pandemic. And then as we've worked through all the, you know, the supply chain shortages and, and kind of, you know, when we went through that period of our schools open or are they not, are they shutting down for a week? They were continuing to really be on the front lines, really providing meals, making sure that the kids had nutritious food, right, to support them in their lives. So, Ria, we've heard about the supply chain issues affecting pretty much every industry. Has that abated? Is it better? Yes and no. I mean, it's still very inconsistent in terms of what foods our members can get access to. We've heard stories recently about a number of providers actually pulling out of markets. And so whether it's distributors, so they're not driving trucks to schools anymore, or I know that a couple of our members were actually finding that some of the dairies are no longer providing milk to schools. And so if you can imagine situations where some of our members literally can't get the food that they need. And in other areas, they're not having as many problems. So it's unfortunately, it's really different depending on what part of the country you're in. Wow. Well, we're going to spend some more time talking about that. But before we do, 
Tell us about your journey to becoming Chief of Staff and Vice President of Strategy and Governance. And I'm particularly interested in the governance piece because if for any of my listeners who've listened to many of my podcasts, it's amazing how often governance shows up as something that really helps to fuel an organization. But tell us about your journey. Yeah, my journey has been a little bit interesting. I know several of your other guests have had interesting journeys as well. <laughs> they all do. Right. Right. So I actually initially entered the workforce intending to work in museums. And so I got a degree in museum and field studies. Wow. Yeah. Had a number of internships, really was planning to work in like a science center or natural history museum and found myself in a position. An internship was ending and I didn't have a job lined up after I got my degree and accidentally wound up working for an association, which I feel like... <laughs> Happy accident. Shocker, right? And what wound up happening is in that role, I was brought into the organization on the programmatic side to work with some of their subgroups. And I had a great rapport with the IT director and actually wound up transitioning into the IT team and then taking over the IT team when he left. And, you know, I found it really interesting because I've never had a background in IT, but I do see how systems connect to each other and how you can meet business needs with systems. And so, through that pathway, I eventually moved into an operations role in the organization and recognized how important to me it is to be able to really help an organization grow and flourish through the application of both systems and processes, but also employee engagement and empowerment. Ah, And so that led to my first chief operating officer job in another organization. And then after a couple of those, I found myself in a chief of staff role with the School Nutrition Association. That's how I landed where I'm at. <laughs> so at SNA, you talk about how you're an operative for change. What does that mean? So I really love change for change's sake. Just kidding. <laughs> so you're one of those rare people who really loves change? <laughs> I actually am one of those rare people who loves change, just not for change's sake before anybody gets nervous out there. I have a tendency to be able to look at an organization and see within that organization how we can shift and adjust and make modifications to both improve the lives of staff living in the organization, right, as we are every day as well as look at our processes and systems to make sure that we're really serving the members in the best way possible. And for me, bringing those two things together really results in a very high performance environment, right? Because you have employees that are doing high value work and they see the value of the work they're doing and it's efficient, right? They don't feel like they're mired in, in processes that are just not a good use of their time. And I think for me, as I walk into any organization, I'm looking for those places where I can take bits and pieces, I can make small changes without blowing something up so that I can actually start to either streamline processes or increase engagement and so give staff more of a voice in the work that we're doing or more of a voice in the changes that they perceive will help them do their jobs better or will help meet our members' needs better. So your job is literally, as chief of staff, to focus on employee happiness and employee productivity, it sounds like. And few organizations I know have someone dedicated to that. I would say that it is an underlying component of every single thing I do in the organization, yes. I don't think you'll actually find that in my job description other than possibly a quick line that says <laughs> something about organizational culture. But, you know, I've really discovered over my career that if employees are engaged in the work you're doing, if you are listening and hearing when they're bringing up, this process doesn't work for me, or it takes 15 steps for me to do X, Y, Z, or when we don't celebrate this holiday, it's problematic for me as an employee. As you start listening to those things, you can always find little ways to shift either your processes or your policies or the way that you approach things in the organization that create a much more powerful environment that the staff can work with it. So let's talk about some specifics. But before we do that, how is SNA doing? So SNA is actually doing really well. We went through the pandemic. We did lose a lot of members over the course of the pandemic. A lot of it was because everybody was so focused on feeding kids, right? It became less important <laughs> to pay dues and more important to feed the kids. However, 
we were one of those organizations that really leaned into that gap. I've seen organizations that sort of stepped back, didn't know what to do for their members in that time period. We really, really stepped into the center of that. You had to. We had to. And on a day-to-day basis and week-to-week basis, we were trying to figure out, like, what are the services they need from us to do their jobs better? What education can we provide? How do we help continue to connect them to each other? How do we actually do our advocacy work to really support the members? And so that really has helped our members stay connected to us. So even though we saw a dip in membership as we've come out of the pandemic, the membership really has rebounded. Our meetings, we have record attendance at most of our meetings, which I know you're not seeing across the industry. So it's been showing us that by staying connected to our members, by making sure we're meeting them where they need with what they need, we can continue to grow and strengthen our engagement with them and help them stay connected to each other and get what they need. So it's been good. And what did that look like to stay connected? Were there lots of discussions, lots of guidance about how to navigate the pandemic? Was it a lot of Zoom meetings? Like, what did that look like? Yeah, so it was actually a variety of different things. So our organization actually spun up several new products. All of the in-person meetings got canceled, right? Right. So in that gap, we spun up a number of brand new focused like webinar series products for them. We did some virtual conferences that were highly targeted and really narrowly focused. So it wasn't come to our conference and get all of the things that you've always gotten. It was very much like, we know that you need to learn more about this particular topic in this particular moment. And so we were spinning up those products on pretty short notice and had tons and tons of people coming to us because they wanted to be able to connect with each other, learn more about how to go through their day to day, right? In an environment that had changed so much. The other thing we did is we did quite a number of town halls. And so we ah. we really were just getting people in and just talking to each other. And I will say some of our state components actually built relationships with their state government. So like the department within their state government that was responsible for school nutrition, and they were doing like biweekly or regular meetings, like town halls where all the school nutrition professionals could come in and have dialogue with the state folks to talk about the regulations or, you know, what was going on in the schools and things like that, which also really helped from the grassroots space to keep the community connected as well. Boy, it sounds like all those new relationships were forged in the name of keeping the kids fed. And let's hope that those relationships are sticking around. Absolutely. That those relationships are strong. Yep. Hey, so let's talk about how you say you've been able to affect change in the diversity of your leadership through some tiny changes. You know, when we were prepping, you said that you want to be able to affect change over time without people realizing that the change is happening. So is that a sneaky part of your job? Or are you just doing it <laughs> so that, you know, it just happens and people then look around and say, wow, look at what we've become. Right. <laughs> yes. So I wouldn't call it sneaky. I would call it strategic. <laughs> <laughs> so I've steeped myself in change management theory over the years. And one of the things I'm always attentive to is that change management is a deeply personal experience. So going through change is going to be different for every single person. And so there are some people that are highly comfortable with it, like I am. There are some people that, you know, it does not matter that if they can see the positive outcome, that gap between where they are now and where they're going to be, it's going to be challenging for them to overcome. And what I've discovered is that a balance of very large change efforts, like our reorg, and very small change efforts actually helps the organization continue progressing forward. And so with our initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the organization, the work for that actually started many years ago. My CEO actually had started the work. We had an organizational committee. So hang on, let's step back. The reason why you've got a DEI initiative is because you don't have enough people of color or with different backgrounds in leadership, in membership. Like what's the need there? Yeah, that's a great question. Where we are as an organization, our membership has historically been very white and like middle-aged and older women. And some of that came out of what cafeteria workers used to be, right? Predominantly, especially if you think back into the 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of those workers were housewives who you know, when their children moved into the school environment, wanted to stay near them or have something to do. And so many of them actually moved into the cafeterias 
as cafeteria workers. And so a lot of our membership had kind of come in from that generation and it was predominantly white women that were in that space. As we've seen the demographics in the field change with a lot more women of color coming in, we still have males are actually one of our components of diversity. There are many fewer males in the industry than there are women, Mm. which is interesting for us as we'd have diversity conversations in the organization, right? We're seeing more individuals that are kind of coming in that are non-white. And what's happening is that a lot of them are not surfacing into the volunteer and leadership positions Ah. and board level in our organization. And, And we've been up and down, right? There have been times where we've had a few persons of color on our board. I don't think we've ever had more than maybe two or three on an 18 person board. So, you know, in the world we live in today, that's really not representing the actual diversity that we're seeing in the workers at schools. So you're putting in place some small changes. We are. To make the leadership and the volunteer cadre more diverse. So talk to us about some of those changes. Absolutely. So some of those changes, so the organization prior to me coming in had a leadership development committee. So the intent of the committee has been paired recruiting function along with the selection of our slate to go up for election. And one of the things that I've been doing with that committee is really starting to understand where they're most effective, where we can do more, and how we support that committee in connecting to the changing demographics of our marketplace. So fortunately and unfortunately, COVID actually gave us a pretty significant opportunity to really rethink how we were doing things. So predominantly in-person recruiting was happening before COVID. As part of COVID, one of the significant things we actually did was shift to virtual recruiting. And I perceive it as a tiny thing, but we were actually, we've started doing recruiting training that is more HR centered with our cohort of leadership development committee members. And so they actually, as when they're onboarded into the committee work, they're actually trained in some of the methodology behind HR consulting, which is much more about cold leads, right? And like warming up your leads, about really doing the research on individuals before you're coming in, staying active in those social networks and making sure that you're looking for people who are sharing ideas and really well connected in the way we want our members connected. Ah. And you're also looking for the elements of diversity that we're looking for. So instead of waiting for people to come to you to say, I want to be involved, you're teaching your membership, your leadership to be proactive in recruiting and you're teaching them how to do that. Yep. But then doing it virtually is definitely a big change because if you're recruiting from the people who are coming already to the conferences, which is predominantly white middle-aged women, then you're never really going to change the leadership. So this really opened up recruiting and leadership. So how's it going? Well, so it's going really well because we also paired that strategy with a real assessment of where are we most likely to get the most new leads, right? So we we keep a, a log of all of our contacts, right? So we're treating it like a true pipeline. Uh-huh. And what we were finding is that the conferences we were sending our committee to pre-pandemic was resulting in the same names coming up over and over. We were never getting new names. And so we actually took a slightly larger step last year to send all of them to our annual meeting because we assessed that the place where they are going to meet the most number of new people that they have never seen before and where we have the most diverse audience is at our annual meeting. And so we pulled all of the recruiting out of the other meetings, sent them there. And I was blown away that we had over a hundred brand new leads coming out of that meeting from the committee. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I could not have asked for something better. (laughs) You know, we have a hundred new people now that we have the opportunity to stay connected with, help them grow and prepare to be in the leadership positions that are available to them that we never would have known before. And the other benefit of having done that is that this past year resulted in, because of those very targeted recruiting tactics, this past year wound up being our most diverse slate, in my experience and in the slates that I've seen before. So we have men, we have non-white individuals, we have individuals from across the country. And it's been really fascinating to see those efforts built over several years in small ways pay off in this way. 
Wow, DEI initiatives that are working. Yes, <laughs> it feels good. And I say that with real joy because I come into contact with many organizations that have had DEI initiatives for how many years, and yet I look at their boards and they're primarily white men, for example, with maybe no women, no people of color, or maybe one person. So you're really making some changes. We are. And you talk about them as small changes, but those don't sound like small changes. <laughs> That's what's interesting, I think, about the process, right, is that as I describe them, they do sound bigger, but they're pieces that have been put in place to assure that they happen over three years. So I didn't wake up last year and say, you know what, let's change our budget. Let's only send them to one meeting, right? It's been a lot of conversations, a lot of laying the groundwork, a lot of small things where we're seeing success that enable us to take kind of the one big step that everybody is perceiving. And so that's where, you know, when I go back to the organizational change models, it's thinking about when you lay the groundwork, when you take all the tiny steps and nobody was frightened by them or nobody's seeing critical failures occur and they are seeing successes and they're seeing that that part wasn't that painful, it allows you to build that or use that trust to say, all right, this one, we're going to take a bigger step and we're going to see how it works. And if it doesn't work, it's okay. We'll change back. So you made some small changes over three years, but about a year ago, you had a massive reorg. We did. Tell us about what that reorg was, why you did it, and what's been the result. And this is a reorg of the staffing of SNA. Yep. It's a reorg of the staffing of SNA, and it actually came straight out of our strategic planning efforts. And I should back up a little bit further. We were one of the organizations that during COVID did lay off staff. And so we did have a gap, a staffing gap happening at the time. And we went into strategic planning and came out of strategic planning with a very powerful strategic plan with four areas of focus that were well aligned with where the organization needs to go in the future. And the CEO and I recognized as we were going through the strategic planning process that it was actually going to require a shift in our internal resources in order to achieve the new plan. And so after the plan was adopted and accepted, she and I started talking about what that was going to look like. And so she and I went through a process where we actually took a step back from the organization and the people we had in the organization. And we actually looked at all the buckets of work that the organization does. And we worked through what the logical structure of those buckets of work were. And when we moved through that, then we worked backwards into, all right, who is the staff that we have right now? And which of these buckets do we want each of the vice presidents to oversee? And then from that, I then worked with each of the vice presidents to do the same process for the new bucket they were overseeing. And so from that, we then looked at the staffing and moving staff around and moving job descriptions around and stuff. And so it, it wound up being about a six-month process, moving through how we connect the strategic plan into the work of the organization, and then moving from that into the staffing that resulted in about I want to say it was about 70% of our positions were touched in some way, shape, or form. Wow. Yeah. Many of our staff either had a new supervisor or were in a new reformulated department, even if you know their piece was similar. And we wound up hiring, I think, 11 new positions into that new structure. And so it, it is a very, very different organization than it was just four years ago. And on top of that, the leadership team is still basically the same people. You know, we've had me and one other new person come into the leadership team in the last three years. So it's been very interesting to go through that process and work through that with the staff. So with this reorg, many people have a new manager. What's that like to have all those conversations and how do you message it? Do you message it slowly? Do you say, hey, we're going to make some big changes and here's the new reorg and here's the new kind of org chart, poof? So, you know, I will say that was one of the most powerful things that happened with this reorg. You know, after the CEO and I sort of set the big structure, and because we did very deep work with each of the VPs on structuring their teams for the future, a very significant part of it was we're thinking about the new strategic plan and where do we need to be in the future. Those VPs really had ownership over what their area was going to look like. And it resulted in them being able to speak really intentionally and eloquently to what the structure was when they were pulling new team members in, like, what is your role here? How are we going to pull you in? How are we going to have the conversations about shifting roles? 
And was the whole staff involved or at least knowledgeable about the changes? Once we started rolling them out, yes. We needed to make sure that the VPs were really comfortable with their new structures. And in that, when they started sharing what the puzzle pieces were going to be, we did ask all of them to have the conversation about like, hey, your position, it's been changed, you know, in these four ways. Are you seeing anything in your role that you think we're missing or that you think that you're suddenly seeing that there's a gap because you know you used to do this kind of work, but you don't know which department's picking it up, that sort of thing. Ah, so it wasn't just, here's your new position. It was, let's have a conversation about your position. Here's where we think it's going, but let's talk about your goals and the needs of the organization. Yep, absolutely. And I will say, you know, not to make it sound like it was all beautiful roses. Oh, I imagine it was hard. (laughs) (laughs) It was difficult. And there were hiring gaps, right? We're a year later and some of those gaps are just finally getting closed where one department was actually passing off a piece of work to another department and we had to hire the new employee that it was going to get passed off to. And so, you know, we are watching that seamless handoff now, but there were definitely periods of time where there was tension around, like, we really want this piece of work off of our plates. We know it's going somewhere else, but we don't have anywhere to send it yet. But I will say that the interdepartmental dialogue around that has been really positive. There's not been like sniping or negativity or anything like that. You know, my hope is that some of that comes from the openness in our discussions about it, the openness around where things are going to go, the openness around we're going to hire as quickly as we can. We want to make sure we bring the right hires in, things like that. Would you have been able to do this had the pandemic not happened? Who? have been able to. (laughs) I would have wanted to. Okay. I will say that the gap that was created by the layoffs enabled us to do this in a very different way than had that gap not been created. Mm. So we were able to do this without any layoffs. And I, in reflecting on the experience, I do not know that we would have been able to do it without layoffs had those gaps not been there. Ah. I mean, we effectively had a 10 position flexibility in reorganizing the whole organization, which I do feel like contributed to our success. Wow. So perhaps one really great thing that came out of the pandemic in the midst of a lot of hardship and a lot of people working really hard. Hey, before we end, and I want to thank you for sharing so much, you know, I was cruising your website before this podcast interview, and you've got something called Breakfast in the Classroom. What is that? Yeah, so Breakfast in the Classroom is one of the programs that brings food into the classroom for children. And so the theory behind the program is that there are children who actually are not do not have access to a good breakfast in their home. And anyone who has children knows when they don't eat, they become really cranky. Right. <laughs> They're cranky or they have trouble paying attention. And so the intent of the program is actually to provide a structured way and a space in which Food can be brought into the classroom, so kids actually are able to get a healthy meal before they start their learning for the day. Now, many schools actually offer breakfast before school, but this is meant to bring food into the classroom because many kids just get to school and don't have time, don't have the ability to have the breakfast before school starts? I believe that's the case, and I think some of the programs may actually be doing it not in the classroom, but in the cafeteria. But I do know that it's interesting because the breakfast in the classroom program, I also started hearing a a lot more about it in terms of coming back from COVID, right? And minimizing the number of times kids were having to transition from one location to another, keeping them sort of with their pod in class. And so, Uh, you know, in those cases, it really was bringing the food into the classroom so that the kids could actually eat at their desks without having to go through large group interactions to get food. Wow, Rhea, amazing work that you're doing at SNA. And thank you to your members who are taking care of our kids. They're incredible. Yeah. Hey, I hope you'll come back and let's get your CEO on so she can talk about all the great things that SNA is doing. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, 
is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye.